uh, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the questions that I had assigned um, through the AP site. So looks like question four in general we had a tough time with. So let's kind of go through this. So this was like a story problem. It says an autom <clears throat> automobile is driven on a straight road and the distance traveled by the automobile after time t0 is given by the quadratic function s, where s of t is measured in feet and t is measured in seconds for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 12. Of the following, which gives the best estimate of the velocity of the automobile in feet per second at time t equals 8? So this function s of t here is not speed, because if you look at the unit, it's measuring it in feet. s of t is position, right? That's just how far the thing has traveled. How do we measure velocity? Displacement over time. So a slope of a position function at a point would represent the velocity at that time, right? Everybody agree with this? So when we're looking for a velocity, given a position function, we need to be considering slope. So immediately should be down to C or D. Okay. Which one would give us the better estimate of the slope at time 8 using the information from time 12 and 2 or the information from time 7 and 9? Seven. 7 and 9, right? You want the two points that are closest is going to give you the best estimate at a point, right? So it should have been D. Does that feel okay as to how I kind of worked my way through that? Okay. Um, and then what other one? Maybe look at this one. Bunch of us missed that one. Is it going? Is it not going? Try it again. There it goes. It says the function f is continuous and increasing for x greater than or equal to negative one. The above table gives the gra or gives the values of f at selected values of x. Which of the following is the best approximation for the limit as x approaches zero of e to the negative two times f of x? So I can. With this limit, what I can do is I can take that limit on, or the limit as x approaches 0 for f of x and just plug it into the e to the negative 2. And the way I'm going to take that limit for f of x is I'm going to use the table provided. Okay. So if I look at the left-hand limit as we move towards 0, looks like we're heading towards 0. If I look at the right-hand limit, as I move towards zero, looks like we're heading to zero. So I conclude that the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is zero. Would you agree with that? So if I plug that in, then I have e to the negative two times zero, which is e to the zero, which should be one. Any non-zero number to the zero is equal to one. Does everybody feel okay on that? Check. Correct. I, I, I want to make sure that the limit exists. Okay. I mean, obviously, because that's one of the options down here is oh. that the limit does not exist. So I have to check to make sure that, that, that both of them match before I go bombing away and answering anything. Okay. Does that feel okay? Okay. Um, does anybody remember anything from here that they wanted to talk about other than these couple that I noticed that maybe more than I would have expected kind of missed it? Certainly that one where only two of us got it was one we need to talk about, but that's okay. I think probably that 
S being for position confused the bejesus out of us. That's the canonical letter to use for a position function. So you'll see that frequently. S for position, V for velocity, A for acceleration. Um, okay. And we'll continue to kind of work on these things periodically. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we'll start with some homework questions before we jump into the next section. Does anybody have anything from 2122 or 23? Tegan? Um, 2.2, number 39. 2.2, number 39. Now, were you looking at the, uh, uh, the, the physical? Okay. Just needed to double check. So this one says determine the limit as, uh, the limit of uh, 1 over x cubed minus 1 from the left and from the right using values and then reasoning and then the graph, right? Yeah. That's the one? Okay. So if I'm going to do this by values, let's go ahead and type this in first. And then vars, y vars function. And we'll go from the left first. So what's, oops, we're going towards one. Um, so maybe we'll try 0. 0.5 and then 0. 0.9 and then 0. 0.99. And maybe 0.999. And what do we notice that things keep happening? Keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It looks like that's heading towards negative infinity when we go from the left. Everybody kind of agree with that? Now let's check from the right. So I'll start above 1. So maybe I'll start with 1.5. And then maybe try 1.1. And then 1.01, 1 .01. oops, that always makes me like motion sick whenever it does that on me. And then 1.001, 1 .001. I think at that point, I see it's just cut, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It looks like this one is bombing off towards positive infinity, okay? Um, it then says to use reasoning, similar to what they did in example 9. So if I'm putting in, if I'm going from the left, I'm putting in values that are a little less than 1, right? So when I cube those, I'm going to still get another number that's a little less than 1. When I subtract that number by 1, I'm going to get a negative. Everybody agree with that? And as that number, as these numbers get uh, closer and closer to 1, the difference between that number and, and 1 is going to continue to get closer and closer to 0, but still be negative the entire time. So this should be bombing off towards negative infinity, like we observed from the table. If I'm going from the right, I'm going to be picking numbers that are just slightly bigger than 1. When I cube them, they're going to continue to be just slightly bigger than 1. So when I subtract 1, I'll always be getting a small number, but positive. That should be bombing off towards positive infinity, which is what we observed. And then the last one, I think, just asked to look at the graph. So if I just graph that on kind of a standard window, the left end is going towards negative 1, and the po right end is going towards positive 1, or negative infinity and positive infinity, which is kind of what we saw from the previous parts. Tegan, is that? Yeah, yeah. So again, it was just like, do this three ways so you get familiar with like 
three ways we could estimate the value of a limit or whatever. Even in this case where it's like it's an infinite one where you can't just plug in, you know, do a direct substitution, drop the value in or whatever. Um, other questions from the homework? Luke? Not sure. 27 from 2.3. These ones in here can get algebraically kind of sticky. So good ones to ask about. Correct. They're all for next go around. Okay. This is the problem. Okay. So my issue is when I plug 16 into the denominator, I get a zero denominator, right? So I can't use direct substitution on this. So what I'm going to want to do is to do some sneaky um, algebra stuff hopefully get that some you know get a something out of that denominator so here we go you ready for some sneaky algebra stuff first thing if I look at the denominator you should notice right away that there's a greatest common factor of X that you should be able to see right away everybody okay with that now here's the sneaky thing. I noticed this and this look kind of similar, right? I need to think about this as a difference of two squares. Specifically, I need to think about it as four squared minus the square root of x squared, which is a pretty dirty sneaky trick, Mr. Kulik. But now that I've shown it to you, it should be um, a little less sneaky. Does everybody kind of see that? So I can write that as 4 minus square root of x, 4 plus square root x. So those can reduce. And now we've got it to a state where I can just use direct substitution. So what's that come out to be like one over 32 or something? No, one over 24. Oh no, one over 120, okay. 16, I was plugging as, anyways. But yeah, so that was the trick, was doing that difference of two squares on something that wasn't so clearly a difference of two squares, right? Um, and again, the thing that pointed that out to me was that I had this square root up here. It's like, well, I have to somehow cancel out this 16 minus x because that's really getting in the way. The top has a 4 minus square root x. It's like, oh, hey, 4, 16, those are squares. And that was what, what I saw to kind of cue me into thinking, oh, that's a sneaky little trick. And that kind of thing will come up rather frequently. Like differences of two squares that maybe are not obvious difference of two squares is like this one was. Jack. Um, do uh, uh, 20, Same section? Yeah. Sure. Uh, is it similar? Not as obvious. I don't think it's obviously that similar. I think this one is one where I would want to multiply by the conjugate and hope for the best. It's kind of, I think, what I would probably try here. Um, so here, again... I see that I'm going to have trouble. I can't direct substitute that. Um, 
and I don't see an obvious difference of two squares to apply, right? If I factor, I'd have square root of u plus 2 and square root of u minus 2, but those aren't reducing with the numerator at all. So I think I probably want to try multiplying by the conjugate of the numerator and hope that that uh, will help me out there. I think that'll do it. Okay. So limit u approaches 2. So I'm going to have the square root of 4u plus 1 squared minus 3 squared over u minus 2 times 4u plus 1 plus 3 So when I simplify that numerator down, I'm going to get 4u plus 1 minus 9, which is 4u minus 8. And when I factor a 4 off of that, there's my u minus 2 hiding in there somewhere. And what do I have left up here? Just a 4. And then and now we're good to go with direct substitute. Yeah. A little, little less obvious that multiplying by the conjugate was going to be the thing that helped you out there since the problem was in the denominator and the radical was in the numerator. But looked like our best option compared to like there's no factoring thing that looked like was going to help us there so might as well try it sometimes they just shake out and work out like that yeah luke 32 yeah so that something is called a complex fraction where you have fractions inside of fractions like that And that can be kind of a bugger to work with. And I'm going to just write that denominator as h over 1, like as a fraction also. OK, so you have two options that you can do here. Um, you can think about it as like numerator divided by denominator, and then you can multiply by a reciprocal, which is probably what I would do in this case since the denominator is so simple. So that's going to be like 1 over h times all this stuff. that okay? Now that gets rid of the fraction side of a fraction, which is nice, but I'm no closer to being able to evaluate this limit. So what I'm going to have to worry about then is simplifying this stuff in here. To simplify this stuff in here, what am I going to need? Common denominator? That common denominator would just be x plus h squared times x squared, right? So this piece, the first piece is going to need an x squared. And the second piece is going to need the x plus h squared. Still feeling OK with what I did there? Give a minute for people to process. I see some funny looks as they're thinking through making the common denominators and all that. All right.
right? I'm going to distribute now, I should say FOIL, and then distribute the negative. Is that okay? And now I see the good stuff. So those x squareds cancel. And I'm left with just this stuff that I can factor off a negative h. Give me 2x minus h there. So I can. And then it's just plug them in. Now direct substitution is available to me. Oops. Uh, that should be a plus H here. Sorry, guys. How are you able to eliminate that H outside? Cancelled with this H. So what do we get? We get like uh, negative 2 over x to the second. Oh, to the third. Excuse me. Yeah. Right, negative 2x over x to the fourth reduces. Okay. I thought that's what I overheard you guys talking through. Okay. Does that feel okay? Luke, you're happy? Okay. Yeah. So, what do we see in here? Algebra is really the hard part here. Evaluating the limit where you're just plugging the number in, ain't no big deal. Getting, doing the algebra to get it to a place where you can plug the number in, that's the, that's the issue. Now, especially on these previous ones that were all numeric, where there's just like one variable in it, what could you also feasibly do at the start? Graph it on your calculator. Look at the picture. Get an idea of where this is going to. So when you get done, you're like, oh, good, I got that right. Or, oh, no, something must have happened. Let me take a look. Make sure I typed in my calculator correctly first. Or that I'm looking at the right limit. You know, but very helpful. Anybody else in 2.3 for any other homework questions for right now? You can always come back and get more later. Jill? Can you move over from 2.2 uh, to the book? Mm -hmm. uh, number 35. Mm -hmm. So it says determine the infinite limit. The limit as x approaches. I'm sorry, 39. Oh, we did this, I think, didn't we? Okay. I was like, this is the first one I thought we asked about. That's okay.
All right. Does it give me any direction as to how I need to do this? Uh, nope. Just says evaluate the limit, right? Right. De or determine the infinite limit. I'm going to use my calculator and look at the graph then. So remember, cosecant is not a function on my calculator, but what is cosecant the same as? 1 over sine. 1 over sine. Does the AP Calc expect you to have that memorized? Yes. Yep. So I'm going to graph x over sine x. Everybody's cool? And then the window I'm going to graph this on, I'm interested in uh, negative, or what is that, at 2 pi. So let's go 0 to 4 pi, and I'll go by pi over 2s, and let's take a look at that. So this right here is 2 pi. Hmm, what's going on? I see this little thing here, but I don't see anything else happening. What do you think's the problem? I don't think my y values are big enough or small enough. So I'm just going to make those bigger. I don't know, like 50 is probably sufficient. We'll see. So there, ah, that's a better. So again, this is pi or 2 pi here. So there's my picture. And I want from the left, so I'm looking at this end of the graph right here. So I would just say it goes to negative infinity. Is sine to the negative one is not the same as cosine? It is not the same. That is sine inverse. That's an inverse trig function. So if you had typed it in as x sine x and then did the negative one exponent there, yeah. that would be OK. Oh. But that's not the same thing as x sine inverse x sine inverse is the name of a function nice. sine x to the negative one is the reciprocal of sine oh, okay. same thing as cosecant you feel good yeah yeah no problem dude all right anybody else two point one number nine Sure. So it says the point 1, 0 lies on the curve of y equals sine 10 pi divided by x. If q is the point x comma sine 10 pi over x, find the slope of the secant line pq. Correct to four decimal places for whole mess of x values. Do those appear to be approaching some limit? Uh, I would use my calculator to, to do all those evaluations because that looks like a big old pain in the tuchus. So I'm going to do that. Type that in. Cool with that. Okay. And then it wants the slope of the secant. So I'm going to do math frac. And it says PQ, so Q is like the second point, so I'll put that one first. So the Y coordinate I'm going to get by Y bars of the first value it gives me to use is 2. And then point P, the Y coordinate is 1. Nope, I'm sorry, is 0. And then the X coordinate at the first X coordinate we're using is 2. And the x-coordinate at p is 1. So I have that. Gives me 0. Okay. And then it says then do 1.5. So I'll just change the 2s to 1.5s. Okay. And it says 1.4, I think. So this is all I'm doing. I'm just going to keep doing this for all the values. Sounds so far so good, Anise? Yeah. Okay. 
What are we noticing so far? Well, I went zero and then I went up and then I went down and went down some more. This is not looking very promising, but let's maybe keep going. Um, what's next? 1.2. Now we went back up again. Uh-oh. I'm going to skip some. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Because it just, like, quite frankly, we're supposed to be going towards one. I'll just go do this one. And we went back down again. Does this appear to be heading towards anything? Doesn't seem like it, right? All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the graph then. Since we're looking at values from 0.5 to 2, so maybe I'll just do that, 0.5 to 2. And we'll go up by maybe tenths or something. And then these things were, seem like they're all between like negative 3 and positive three or something. I don't think they were very big values, so I'm just going to try that. Everybody cool? And maybe even let's do this also. I'm going to put in the point um, one zero and have that show up just so I can see where that point P is, right? Because that's what we're looking at trying to get to. Oh, well, I see the issue. Here's point, here's 1.1, 1 .1, and here's 0.9-ish. The graph, the function, really doesn't settle down and start behaving until I get in between 1.1 1 .1 and 0.9, right? So the values that I picked for my table really weren't settling down very nicely. I need to pick values that were much finer grained. So I need to pick all my values between like 1.1 and 0.9. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so if I do that and say we'll do like Is that too many? That was too many. Try doing that. That looks a bit nicer, right? Because I'm looking at the slope of this line, right? This is from 0.5 to 2, so this is only 1.5 across. Look at how steep that is in comparison. That's pretty doggone steep, so like a negative, and it's a negative slope, right, coming through here. So like a negative 31 is not an outrageous number there. Um, and what it, ooh, Boise, I did it again. That always like makes me car sick when I click that and it just jumps across to the other side of the screen on me. If I do it from the other end, I'm getting like the same thing. So negative 31.4 looks pretty good to me. I just wasn't close enough to the point that I cared about using the table values that I got in part A. Does that feel okay, Anise? So again, using both the graph and the table, usually a pretty good idea because the table values we pick, just like, you know, we're getting like points over here it was just like it's jumping up and down, or points over here where things are just jumping up and down. Not super helpful to me. You know what I mean? I needed to get real close to that point, so I was on like just that little section of the graph to get a decent secant out of it. Julian? Can you show me the The point one zero? Yeah, I just did stat and then edit typed in the point one zero, oh. and then I turned on plot one. So just like if you're typing in a scatter plot or whatever in stats. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that's... So I just 
plot it as a point. Cool, Anise. Um, let's start the next section then, huh? So we had, last time we finished 2.3, we are skipping 2.4 because that's all epsilon delta stuff that I told you that we weren't going to do. And we're just going to do section 2.5 today. So we say that a function or uh, section 2.5 is all about continuity. We say a function f is continuous at a number a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. Now, if I look at that definition here, oops, this is like a definition. Nothing is working for me today. Do you ever feel like just the universe just hates you? Yeah, definitely. It's like, why is this such a problem? It's, what did I do to you, universe? You know? Like, was it all the littering that I did as a kid before I knew how bad littering was? Is that really what's going on? Are you that petty? It wasn't even that much littering. Just like some candy wrappers and like an apple core or something. There it goes. And the apple cores don't even count, right? Like some animal is going to come by and eat that. The candy wrappers I get. Anyways, um, okay, so here's our first definition. This is basically continuity at a point, right? So there's kind of three things inherent inside this definition. So first thing, we're assuming that A is in the domain of F. Since F of A exists, a has to be in the domain, right? What else do we assume? Well, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a, that limit certainly has to exist. Right? So those two things really are inherent to being able to say that the limit of f of, or as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. The reason we have to be careful about that, say we have a function like this. Is this continuous? No way, man. Or at least not at point A, right? What's the problem at, with that graph that we've drawn? Have we drawn? A is not in the domain of F because F is undefined at A. Everybody agree with that? Okay, Mr. Kulik, well, I'll fix that. If I just put that point there, so this is my A comma F of A. Now is it continuous at A? Well, look at the picture. Still not, right? What's the problem here? Part three, that the limit doesn't agree with the function. Right? This value is my limit, not the same as that value. Right? Everybody agree? So that's 
again, what continuity is saying is that like, hey, the function ends, like the limit ends have to match up, and they have to match up at the value of the function. So it has to connect together. Cool? Okay. Um, so these places where the function is not continuous, if this definition fails at a value of a, we call that a discontinuity. We've used that word a bunch before. Um, so let's just do an example about finding the discontinuities. All right. What do I want to do here? Should recognize this kind of function. What's up? Oh, it's a uh, polynomial. Uh, well, it's a rational function. Oh. Polynomial divided by polynomial. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. What do you want to do with that? Okay. It factors to x minus 2 times x plus 1. Okay. Now what? Okay. Everybody agree that that's completely correct? You're all wrong. Can I demonstrate to you why it's not completely correct? If I do f of 2, no. I prefer to live in ignorance, Mr. Kulik. I get 0 over 0, right? But if I use this definition, if I do f of 2, I get 3. Is 3 the same thing as 0 over 0? Yes, of course. Is that the same? Is 3 the same as 0 over 0? No. Now, if Mr. Kulik picked any other value of x, would this have worked? Yeah. Yeah. There's only one small problem here. Do you remember how we fixed this small problem? You just say it, it simplifies that except at 2. Now, why 2? So we know that a zero denominator is undefined, right? That should not be in the domain for my function. So when I crossed out the thing that was making the zero denominator, or could have made a zero denominator, that's why I have to account for it here. Everybody's okay with that? We had a name for this way back in Algebra 2. Does anybody remember the name for this? We called this a removable discontinuity. So if I were to look at the graph of this at the point 2, 3, there would be a hole. And then I'd have just like my linear function after that. Bye. Have a great day. Thanks. You're welcome. Is everybody okay with that? So what we could say here is that x equals 2 is a discontinuity because... Um, x equals 2 is not in the domain of f of x. Now, you probably could have noticed that right away just by looking at the function that 
without even having to do any reducing or to generate the graph that x equals 2 is not in the domain. Everybody's okay with that? But I wanted to do it this way because I would say a, quite a common mistake would be to do that reducing and say, okay, that's my f of x. The limit as x approaches two, or, uh, 2 for f of x is 3. When I plug 2 in for f of x, I get 3. Continuous at 2, right? Wrong. Remembering that 2 could not be in the domain was like really important there. Is everybody okay with that? Let's look at a different version of the same question. So this one, there was an issue because I had that hole at x equals 2. Right? Well, what if I just say, okay, I'll define a piecewise function that does that same f of x when x is not equal to 2. And then when x is equal to 2, I'll give it a value. So now 2 is certainly in the domain of this function, right? Everybody agree? Yeah. Oops. Says so right here, right? It says 2 is in the domain. Gives it something to do when x is equal to 2. Is this can does this have a discontinuity though? Yeah, so if you remember, this was my graph of the top, and then at 2, we have the point, or, or y is 1, right? So we have the point 2, 1 there. Is there still a discontinuity? Well, sure! Right? We can see, obviously, that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to 3, which is not f of 2, which was 1. So we still have discontinuity at x equals 2, even though 2 is certainly in the domain. Right? We solved the issue that we had in part A. What would my piecewise function need to be for this to be continuous? We need to be at 3. Right? Because if we do that, then it fills in the hole. And we're happy! Everybody feel okay with that example? So we have now this idea of continuity at a point. What we need next is to talk about your back. Hello. Hello. Uh, continuity or one sided continuities. So, maybe we'll frame it this way. So you guys remember, let's call it f of x. This is the graph of the square root of x, right? You guys remember that? What do we want to say about this point here? Is that are we continuous there at zero or not? I mean, the limit as we go from the right is certainly equal to f of zero, but what's the limit as we go from the left? It doesn't exist. There isn't one. So should we call this continuous or not? Well. Let's. This is, seems like something that we want to be like. It's kind of continuous. We're going to have a new definition for something like this. So we're going to have like 
one-sided continuity, we'll be able to describe things that are continuous from the left and continuous from the right. So if the limit as x approaches a from the left of f of x is equal to f of a, we'd say this is continuous from the right, or I'm sorry, from the left. And likewise, if we have the limit as x approaches a from the right, we'd say this is continuous from the right. Bless you. You're welcome. Everybody feel okay here? Ooh, excuse me. Okay. And now that we have these two types of content or additional types of continuity, we can talk about what it means to be continuous on an interval. So we say that function f is continuous on an interval if it is continuous at every number on the or in the interval. And one thing to keep in mind here when we say continuous at every number of, on the interval, if our interval is like um, some closed interval B C, we really just mean like from the right, and we really just mean from the left, when we say continuous, right? Because obviously, if we're talking about on an endpoint of our interval, we only have one side by definition, right? So if we're talking about continuous on an interval, the endpoints are only going to be one-sided continuous or continuous, and that's okay that's enough to still call the whole interval continuous, even if the endpoints are only one-sided continuous. Does that feel okay? Ooh. Yeah, man. So like, if we have something that's like a piecewise function, and say it goes like, do to do, and then, you know, does, whatever. If we talk about is the function continuous on that interval, we want to say yes, even though the left end of it is only continuous from the right, and the right end is only continuous from the left, it's okay. We're still going to call that interval continuous even if the endpoints aren't full continuous, they're one-sided continuous. Is that, that feels okay? Yeah, right? Like that, okay, that makes sense. That thing should be called continuous, right? So uh, let's look at an example of showing something is continuous on interval. All right, so it says show f of x is equal to 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared is continuous on the interval negative 1 to 1.
So this says show. So what we're, what we're really talking about is a proof, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick an arbitrary number on that interval. So I'm just going to pick some value of a that's on that interval. And a can be is general, right? So this is OK to do in a proof. We want a general value. And then we want to show two things, right? First, we need to show a is in the domain of f of x. And we've seen that we have to be careful about this because in that first example of continuous at a point, I showed you an example where if you didn't check about the continuity, it would be very easy to, or check the, the values in the domain, it'd be very easy to conclude something was continuous when it wasn't. So if I look at the square, or if I look at f of x, what type of function do I have here? Yeah, it's a square root function. And where can I get in trouble with square roots? When you square root a negative. So what I'm going to care about is the part under the radical needs to be non-negative. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of investigate the domain here for this function. And the only part that I need is the part underneath the radical to do that. Everybody so far so good? So to solve for x, I can just square root both sides and just say this then, right? No? Okay. Oh, it's because I forgot the plus or minus. And just say that then, right? Also no. So think about what this is really saying. So we have the we have x squared, right? So it looks like this. And we have the y coordinate 1. So we're looking for the values of x that are less than 1. Well, we're, that should be x is less than or equal to 1, or x is greater than or equal to negative 1. I should say and, excuse me. Everybody agree? And that is exactly the interval that they gave us to look at. So a is definitely on that. A is definitely in the domain, since the domain is the interval that we're working from. Okay, good. The next thing I need to show is that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. Everybody okay there? All right, um, so I'll just start with the left-hand side and try to end at the right-hand side. So I'll plug in my value for f of x. And then I'm just going to use my limit laws. So I can distribute that limit like so. Everybody good? What's the limit as x approaches a of 1? 1. Very good. And then I know that I can take uh, the limit of a composition. is the composition of the limit. So I can just like take that limit and put it underneath 
the square root. Everybody's okay there? So, this was one of our limit laws, provided the limits exist. We can do this, so that's what I did. Is that okay? Okay. So again, like the limit of a composition is like the composition of the limit. It's basically what we're saying there. And then I can again distribute that limit And then I can evaluate, right? So it's going to be 1 minus square root limit as x approaches a of 1 was 1. The limit as x approaches a of x squared is a squared. Everybody still good? And what is this equal to? It's just f of a, my dudes. All right, if you go back and look at f of x, I plugged A in, right on, Mr. K, we're done. Do -do -do -do. Everybody's okay here? All right, so this process here, kind of a pain in the butt, right? The next set of theorems are going to be ways that we're, we don't need to do this every time we need to show something's continuous. So here we go. Uh, whole mess of theorems here, designed to make our lives easier and be able to tell if things are continuous or not, just kind of by looking at them. Yes, Jillian? So if I look at f of x, what is f of a? I just replaced the x with an a, right? Yes. Which is exactly what I have in that last step. Okay. That's why I'm able to conclude that it's f of a. But from the second last step to the very last step, how are you able to look at the functions? This right here? Yeah. Like it's just simple. f of x is this, right? So if I plug an A in, it should be this, right? That's what I have here. So I can call it F of A. The function at the beginning is this, right? So what we wanted to show in step two is that the limit as x approaches f of x is equal to f of a. f of a is 1 minus the square root of 1 minus a squared, right? If I go down, that's what I have right here. That's f of a. Oh, I see. Oh, I did, it's oh, like yeah. I didn't do anything. I just uh, I just okay. noticed that like, oh, That's good. The same thing. Okay. That's the same thing. Yeah. You good? I'm good. Yes. Okay. Let me get rid of these guys. All right. Um, theorem dump time. And then we'll talk about like why these theorems are important, how we can kind of use them together. So if F and G are continuous at A and c is a constant, then the following are also continuous. f plus g, f minus g, 
C times F. F times G. F divided by G, provided that G of A is not zero. So what do we have here? The sum of continuous functions is continuous. The difference of continuous functions is continuous. A scalar multiple of a continuous function is continuous. The product of continuous functions is continuous. The quotient of continuous functions is continuous, provided that the denominator is not equal to zero at that value of x. Really nice, right? Yes, Teeks. Sorry, what's the last part? G, is that G of A? Uh-huh, not is equal to zero. zero. Yeah. Because we can't say that F divided by G is continuous at A if G of A is zero, right? So that's all that's just covering the no doi case, right? Okay. Um, so we can also say that polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. And when I mean, when I say everywhere, I mean all real numbers. And we can say that rational functions are continuous. Can I say they're continuous everywhere? No, we definitely know they're not. Where are they continuous though? on their domains. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, in addition to these two, we have a whole mess of others. that are continuous on their domains. Uh, root functions, so square roots, cube roots, etc. Trig functions. Inverse trig functions. Uh, exponential functions, and then logarithmic functions. So maybe we ask something like, where is f of x continuous? Ah! It's a scary looking function we just wrote down here. 
All right. Well, let's do it. Let's do it piece by piece. What's the domain for x squared? All real numbers. Why? It's a polynomial, right? Good enough. Uh, domain for the cube root of one minus x. No, nope, all real numbers. Remember, because you can cube root negatives as well as positives and zeros, right? Uh, domain for sine of x. Yeah, what's the domain? All real numbers. Okay. And then 2 to the x. All real numbers, right? Negative exponent just makes a reciprocal. Zero exponent makes it one. Positive exponent is fine. Okay. So what's the domain of f of x? The one thing we have to worry about is denominator being zero. Can 2 to the x equal zero? No. So the domain for f of x is all real numbers. How baller was that? I mean, I don't know if they're all that easy, but they can be that easy. Where all we're doing is using previous knowledge about domains of stuff. To just be like, oh, okay, okay, okay. What if some of these things had discontinuities? Right, you just take, all, you just take the intersection of all the domains. So each discontinuity in any individual function creates a discontinuity for f of x. So you're just collecting all the discontinuities and those all become discontinuities for f of x, but it's continuous everywhere else. Does that make sense? Uh, well, if you had a square root function, the domain is not everywhere. If you had a rational function, the domain is not all real numbers. If you had a logarithmic function, the domain is not all real numbers. If you had an inverse trig function, the domain is not all real numbers. I specifically chose pieces that it would just, like everything would be really cute. You know. Is that okay? It's just Mr. Kulik getting cute on you guys. All right. Um, but the point, the point what I'm trying to illustrate is like how powerful those set of theorems are in your ability to look at something and go, continuous, right? You can just look at each piece, the domain of each piece, which makes life so much easier than otherwise. You know what I mean? All right. Um... Next up, we have a couple of continuity things about compositions, which is also super useful. So again, what we're saying here, um, provided that we have continuity, then we can say the limit of the composition is the composition of the limit.
And now that we have that, So if g is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, then the composition f of g of x is continuous at a. Bless you. So let's take a look at this one where we have sine of x squared minus 7x plus 3 and ask where is it continuous? Where is the inside continuous at? x squared minus 7x plus 3. Where is that continuous? All real numbers. Great. Why? because it's a polynomial. Excellent, okay? So what is the range for that polynomial? The vertex, the y-coordinate of the vertex, the positive infinity, right. Is sine continuous for those values of x? Yes, why? Because sine is continuous for all real numbers. On its do it's continuous on its domain, which is all real numbers. So any subset of the real numbers, obviously, it has to be continuous at. So what values of x is f of x continuous for? All real numbers. And my pen stopped working for because it, in the universe, Again, likes to poop in my eye or something. I guess not, right? Now, now it wants to work again. Now that I've acknowledged the universe is making making my life difficult. Um, where are we at? That's class. This is a great time to stop because we'll pick up at the intermediate value theorem next time. FYI. Uh, Thursday is the X day, right? Yeah. yeah. Feels like a good day to make sure that you're finished up through like, or you're familiar up through 2.5. Correct. So. 2.2. <laughs> Just do your best you can. Okay. Okay. Just do your best you can.